Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Buenos dias. Good morning. Well, that was awesome, wasn't it? I, I'm telling you, when I see that, you know, I've been hanging out in the church for 46 years, and there's still something that makes me kind of like want to cry when I see that. Just that, I don't know, it's a pretty moving thing. And what's really cool at this church, you know, I've been to churches where like, we got a baptism this year. I'm like, we get like, the Lord is just bringing people like crazy that are coming to the Lord. I mean, you, as you can see it here, it might be a little too close for comfort, the person you're sitting next to. But that is what happens here, man. I love this church. I'm, I'm Joel, by the way. I'm honored to serve under our senior pastor, Marcus, and uh, his wife, Natalie. And we're going to continue our series today in Proverbs, where we have been doing the series called Live Wise, where we've been looking at wisdom. And, uh, you know, they've said, if you want to learn how to get, a- get along with God, you read through the Psalms. If you want to learn how to get along with people, you read through the Proverbs. And we've been talking about Proverbs and how wisdom is an understanding of how the world works and how it's realizing, as, as Pastor Marcus said last week, every path has a destination. Every step you take in one direction is taking you to somewhere where you want to go, either good or bad. And so you've got to decide, is that where you really want to to go. And we face this constant challenge of everything in life. We go, man, you got to make decisions, right? And every decision is really hard. And a lot of times we make decisions and we don't realize until later the price or the consequence of that decision for good or bad. Have you ever had that experience where you go, uh, I never intended for that to happen. I thought I was doing this. I, I had a dad the other day and he was telling me, he said, you know, I never intended to create a rift with my son. I just thought I was disciplining him. And my dad, he was a military guy and he disciplined me this way. And I thought I needed to discipline my son that way, but it didn't work. And he's like, now my son doesn't like me very much. And he doesn't want to be around me. And I talked to the son and he said, yeah, he's like, my dad thought everything needed about discipline, discipline. He's like, I'm kind of an artist at heart. And I feel like he kind of made it hard. And so there's this rift that he never intended. And the dad's going, I had the best of intentions. But the reality is sometimes we just don't realize what things can do to us. So my wife and I, we go to Mexico several times a year. We love going down to Mexico. And a few years ago, I noticed that when we go to the grocery store in Mexico, all of the food there, it had this one of these little black signs on it. And these are warning things. Like one of them says excess calories. There's two, there's a lot of calories in this food. Some say excess sugar. When you get a Coca-Cola, it says exceso azúcares, right? So there's a lot of sugar in this. This one says excess saturated fat, excess trans fat, excess salt, right? So what happens is there's this warning sign over here that says, if you have too much salt, this will happen. If you have too much this, this will happen. And I thought, well, this is really interesting because they're not saying don't eat it, but they're saying if you drink too many of this, just know what it'll do. If you drink too many Coca-Colas, because sugar will do that to you. And I started thinking, wouldn't it be awesome if in life, before every decision, like if you're walking down the road of life, the aisle of life, and there's some options over here, there was a sign for you that kind of warned you, like, hey, this is what's going to happen if you do this. Like, imagine if somebody came to you and said, hey, we got this job for you, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay you three times what you're making currently, but all of a sudden, a sign would descend from heaven that said this, may cause you to slowly die inside and give up on your dreams. <laughs> and then you go, oh, oh, I didn't, I was doing it for the money, but I didn't know I was going to die inside, and 35 years later, I'm still doing this thing, and I hate it, and I hate my life, and You know, that Thoreau saying, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and they go to the grave with the song still in them. Can you imagine if you had a warning sign like that where you're like, I don't care how much that job pays, I know it's going to make me die inside. Can you imagine if this showed up when you were seeing that girl that was interested in you? (laughs) Or that guy? Like, oh, she's so amazing. He's so amazing. Warning may cause you to die inside and slowly give up on your dreams. That'd make things a lot easier, wouldn't it? It would make life so easy. What, what about this one? If, if like every time, you know, like you feel the need to like criticize someone, you feel like your job is to make sure everyone understands the problems in everything and a sign would pop, maybe it'd pop right on your forehead. Oh. May cause people do not want to be around you. And you're like, why are people avoiding me? Because you're freaking critical. You're always criticizing everyone. And you're like, yes, but they need to know that so they can get on the straight and narrow like me. And you wonder, why am I so lonely? 
because you always got to be right and everybody got to tell everybody else they're wrong. Wouldn't it be nice if we had warning signs like that? Well, the beautiful thing about Proverbs is it gives us principles. And let me, let me explain the difference here between principles and rules, okay? There are 10 commandments that God gave us that he said, I want you to never do these things. They will never go well. So my, friend, uh, my uh, favorite author, excuse me, G.K. Chester, and he says, the chief aim of God's order is to give room for good things to run wild. So God says, look, here's the fence you can play in. Don't do these things. Don't go outside of these things. And we know if you go outside of those things, it's never going to go well. But there's a lot of areas in life, if you haven't noticed, that are some gray areas. And you're like, there's not a Ten Commandment about that. So what do we do? What do we do about that? And that's where principles come into play. Because principles are flexible because they say this. Principles are cause and effect, right? So it's the idea that if you do this, you'll get this. Jesus taught a principle. He said, give and it will be given back to you. And you go, but Jesus, how much do I give? And he goes, you decide. How much do you want people to give back to you? Your generosity dictates how generous people are with you. So you get to decide. And it's not black and white. He says, you, you got to give. But he says, the amount, you get to decide the input that gets the output. The third law of motion says, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And the beautiful thing about principles is in those gray areas of life, if you can come to learn those principles, it can actually help you win in life, which is what we've been talking about. The idea with Proverbs is that wisdom is the path to living in harmony with reality. God, the creator of heaven and earth, he made this world we live in. And if anybody knows how to operate in this world, it's God himself. He put rules and principles into place. And just like if you go jumping off of a cliff, you're going to hit the ground eventually. There are things in life that if we jump off of them, we're going to hit the ground eventually. There are other things that if you learn to work with the principles, you can actually fly. You go, yeah, when you're flying, you're actually beating gravity through using other principles. And so when we live in harmony with what God has taught us, we actually can live victoriously. We can conquer in a lot of areas that we go, and it stops unnecessary suffering. And listen, make no mistake, there's some suffering in life that's necessary. Like we just, there's this verse in Acts that I don't really like very much, but it says it. It says, through much suffering, we enter the kingdom of God. But then there's other things in life that really the suffering is caused because we just kind of wanted what we wanted and we're our own worst enemy sometimes. And we kind of knew all along, eh, it's not the best thing for me to do, but I'm going to do it anyways. And then we go, oh, why does this turn out so bad? Well, because when you do this, you get this. So in many ways, with principles, you get to choose your pain. <laughs> because if you notice in anything in life, there's a sacrifice and some pain to every decision. So you get to decide, how much pain do I want? And you kind of, some situations, they're just two bad decisions and you got to go, I think I'm going to take the lesser of two evils here, right? This, is, this election comes to mind. But that's the reality of a situation. And in life, you have to go, choose your pain. And the cool thing is, like, you get to decide. And you get to say, well, I'm going to drink this Coca-Cola, and I know it's going to cause my blood sugar to surge, but I really want a Coca-Cola right now. But I'm going to not drink a lot of Coca-Colas because I know that it'll cause something bad. You get to decide. And that's how we stop unnecessary suffering. And that's the second point is, listen, you can ignore reality all you want. God's reality, you can ignore it all you want. And we live in a world that tells you, you can create your own reality for a little while, but eventually it catches up to you. And then you got to pay the price for creating your own reality. You, because you can ignore reality, but you can't avoid the consequences of ignoring reality. So eventually reality catches up and we go, ouch, I wish... I wish I would have known. Like, why didn't I know that? And let me tell you something that's really important about principles. They don't care about your feelings. Principles, they don't care about your intentions. <laughs> they don't care about how pure of heart you are. And this is what's scary about it. You can have the best of intentions, the best of motivations, but if you're working against a principle that God has put into place, you're not going to like the results on the other side. And you go, man, I, I really loved my daughter. I really loved my son. But... You know, I, I wanted him to be involved more in church, but we took him to soccer games every Sunday, and I don't understand why he's not going to church anymore. Unintended principle. You didn't value the house of God and, and, the, and the, the value of being with the family of God. You valued soccer over that. You spoke a message to your kids, and I know you didn't intend to. You had the best of intentions for your kids. You wanted to give them the best. But oftentimes, we find situations on the end of it, we go, oh, I never intended for that to happen. And this is why it's so important we get this. In Hosea God says, my people, they, they, it says, my people for lack of knowledge, my people are destroyed. 
when you don't understand how the world works and these principles, you can have the best of intentions. You can be sincere in your heart. And listen, let's be honest. The older I get, the more I don't know if I even know my motivations. I'd like to think I'm a loving person, but a lot of times I'm like, yeah, I'm like 60% loving and about 40% selfish. But I can tell myself I'm really loving. And how many of us were like, I have the best thing in mind. Did you really? Like, let's be honest. We've got to be honest that sometimes we don't know our motivations and intentions. Sometimes we have to just be aware that my motivations are probably mixed in this. And so there might be some unintended consequences of me doing this thing if this is a principle. And this is why it's so important to be in the Proverbs and reading through Proverbs, taking your family through Proverbs and reading them over and over again so you come to understand these principles and how they work. With that in mind, um, I thought today I would share some principles that have been super impacting in my life. And listen, some of these will speak to you. Some of them may not. Uh, You've got a unique mission in life. I've got a unique mission. But I'm going to share some of these proverbs that to me, I just keep coming back to them over and over again and have to remind myself of them to keep me focused. And I would encourage you as you read through the proverbs, this one really speaks to you. Man, write it down. But today I want to share five. I'll, I'll call this wisdom in the wild, my favorite proverbs. I want to talk to you about five proverbs that have really made an impact on me. And if they speak to you, you go ahead and take them. I give you permission to use the proverb. Okay, it's all right. It's not mine exclusively. Right. But you can use it. But here's, here's the, the five that I want to share this morning. All right, the first one is this. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before the great. Well, what does that mean? It means you have a very specific gift, ability, and talent. And if you will stay focused on using and developing that gift to the best of your ability and not get distracted, there's a good possibility that one day you will stand before great people using that gift. I have a friend who six years ago, he started a cabinet making business and he was terrified to start it. And yesterday I was talking to him and he, I said, how's the business going? And he's like, I'm having to turn down work. And he's turn, he is working in these houses. He's like, I'm working in houses that have kitchens, kitchens bigger than my own home. But he found, he, he, he did, he crafted, he honed his craft at cabinet making. And now he, the word has gotten around to all the wealthy people in his area. And he's having to turn down work. I'm like, dude, you hit the jackpot. He's like, sometimes I don't feel like it. But I'm like, you have. Because you were faithful in the thing you're really gifted at. And he tried a bunch of different construction things, but he found cabinets was his jam, Right. And there's something in you that you're so gifted and natural at that you probably don't realize it's there just because it's so natural to you, you think everybody has it, but you have it and you need to recognize what it is. I'll give you an example Um, for my my wife, Emily. She has a tremendous ability to create environments that make people feel welcome. They call it hospitality, right? When she is in a room, she just has people feel like they're welcome here. I mean, she'll go to somebody else's house and they'll feel welcomed even though it's not their, her house because she's got this gift, right? And she thinks everybody has it. So she's like, well, I don't know if it's that great of a gift. I'm like, no, trust me. Because listen, I don't have that gift. Apparently, I scare people when I'm trying to be nice to them. <laughs> so uh, she makes a huge difference in that area. But you know, here's, here's one, of my, one of my gifts, right? And I learned this early on. When Pastor Marcus asked me to come on board here, I said, okay, but here's the deal. Do not get me in administration. I will ruin things if you put me in administration. And he's like, you come here and use your gift to the best of your ability, Joel. And I'm so grateful that he has given me room and ability to do that. I would not be where I am today without Pastor Marcus giving me the freedom to come up here and speak and make you guys my lab rats. I can learn on y'all and test on y'all, right? But I'm so grateful for that. And I write and speak because of that freedom he's given me to stay in my lane. But that's the key. You got to stay in your lane. And here's, here's a really hard point for some of us to realize. I know you think you are, but you are not good at everything. Some of y'all think you're good at everything. And listen, there's this thing in psychology called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is this cognitive bias that makes people who actually don't know a lot about something think they know way more than they do. So true experts in an area, if you talk to them, they'll be like, well, I've got a lot to learn. But you can talk to some people and like, oh, yeah, I know everything about that, which is actually quite narcissistic. I'll never forget I was in a counseling session one time, and this narcissistic guy, somebody asked him, like, are you okay? He's like, well, I'm kind of bored with life. And they're like, why are you bored? And he's like, I've mastered everything. And I was like, <laughs> and she goes, oh, she goes, what about music? And he goes, oh, I, I've mastered music. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Would Beethoven say he mastered music? What kind of a narcissist thinks they're that good at it? But that's, what, that's the natural cognitive thing with us. The less good at something we are, the better we think we are. So just be real careful at saying you're good at stuff. 
Because as you ask people around you, you may not be as good as you think you are. But here's a really important thing. Listen, if you're spending all your time trying to be everything, you can't be the one thing that you're really gifted at. Because it takes about 10,000 hours to develop a gift to its maximum capacity. And Anders Ericsson, he did a lot of study on who, what makes the greatest people the greatest. And they see it's 10,000 hours of discipline practice in an area that makes someone ready for it. Which is kind of what stinks about parenting because by the time you finally figure out what you're doing, the kids are out of the house, right? 10,000 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's challenging. But in so many areas of our life, it takes a long time staying in your lane. But that's the key. You've got to figure out what your gift is. And you've got to stay in that lane and stay focused on it. And don't get distracted. And there may, here's the thing. If you're trying to be everything, you may be robbing somebody close to you of the ability to use something they're really good at in the capacity to help others. And, and the key is this. So there, this real quick, I do a whole teaching on this. I'm going to give you a one-minute summary. There's this thing called the Pareto Principle. And it says that 20% of inputs create 80% of outputs. So about 20% of what you do creates 80% of your best results, okay? You see this all over the world. In fact, a little simple example in churches, about 20% of people in churches give to the church and it funds 80% of the operation. Can you imagine what would happen if 100% of the people gave? That's a side note. But there's something you do that brings the greatest results. And there's some things in your life that only you can do. For example... Only you can be the father to your child. You can bring school in, TV in, but they're never going to do what you specifically you're capable of doing. You go, well, I don't feel very competent at it. Hey, only you can do that. So get it done. If you're a mom and you're going, I feel so overwhelmed by these kids. I don't know if I can do this. Listen, God's gifted you with everything you need to be the parent to your kids. And only you can be the parent to your kids. If you outsource it to somebody else, intentionally or unintentionally, you're not going to like the results. So stay in your lane, your gift, the thing God's placing you, stay focused on it, which leads to my next one, right? The next one is this, like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Now, I think this message is twofold. The first message is this, if you are away from home too much, you are vulnerable, I cannot tell you how many men I've talked to that have fallen into marital infidelity. And it all started because of work trips. And they were out there vulnerable. But you know who else is vulnerable back at the nest when you're gone? Your family. A man, and this specifically happens a lot with men. A lot of times men, they don't feel competent back at the nest. They're like, man, I got this 17-year-old kid living with me and I don't know what to do with him or her. But I, do, I feel competent at work. So they end up spending more and more time at work. And one of the things I've seen is when your kids are most, the most annoying is when they need you the most. And a lot of times we run because we're like, oh, it's so uncomfortable at home. I don't know how to handle this, but I do know how to do things at work. Meanwhile, back at the nest, everyone's languishing and suffering. And we're over here trying to provide. And listen, here's another one. I've seen a lot of guys that they take jobs that offer a lot of money, but it takes them away for their, from their family for two, three, four weeks at a time. And it made them a lot of money, but don't get me wrong on this. Provision is more than money. You, the, the Bible says he who cannot provide for his family is worse than an infidel, okay? But provision is more than money. And sometimes you have to maybe say, I, this is going to take me away from my nest too long, and I can't do this. And yeah, it's a way better pay raise, and I'd love to have that money. But no, my family back at the nest, the home is way too important for me to be away from them all of the time. And you cannot stray from that. And here's a really other important thing. One of my favorite quotes, there was a monk and he, you know, monks live in these cells in the monastery. And one of these monks came to St. Anthony who lived out in the desert. And he said to St. Anthony, he said, St. Anthony, what else do I need to do to become all I can be? And St. Anthony said to him this, he said, go back to your cell and your cell will teach you everything you need to know. Well, what does that mean? Well, the cell is where he was supposed to work and pray and spend his time getting to know God. And I think what he was saying is when you stay focused on staying in your primary domain of responsibility, it will prepare you and teach you for everything you need to know. And you're looking for something out there, but what you need is back there. Make sense? Yes. Everybody got real quiet. This is a powerful principle, though, because I can't tell you how many guys I've seen who have ruined their life because they're away from home too much. And it happens to women, too. Stay close to the nest. Protect the nest. Protect your home. Guard your family as best as you can. Number three, this is the story of my life. <laughs> In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Do you know how many great plans I've had 
had, I've had that as soon as I set out to have these plans, I got, you know, they always say, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. I can't tell you how many times I've had a great plan and then I walk out there and Mike Tyson's like, <laughs> you always want to make a plan. It's good to make a plan, but know this, it's ultimately the Lord who's going to get you where you want to go. And oftentimes we don't actually know where we want to go, which is why the beautiful thing about Matthew 6, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you want will be added to you as well. He's saying, aim at the highest possible good. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're aimed at the highest possible good, you'll get where you really want to be because God created you and he knows where he wants you to be. I talked to this big university a few years ago. And uh, afterwards, after I gave my talk, several thousand students, the student council had a special meeting with me. And they asked me this. One of the kids asked me, how do we do what you're doing? How do we get to where you're at? And I was like, well, first of all, I don't exactly know where I am or what I'm doing. But... (laughs) And he's like, well, who do you get, how do you get certified? And I was like, um, well, there's no certification process. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but who, who certifies you for this? And I'm like, nobody. I got a master's degree in counseling. And then they're like, you can do this, this, or this. I'm like, I don't like any of those things. So I figured out my own thing. But here's the important thing about it. When, you're, when there's something in your heart that you want to do, you need to look at what is the core behind that. For example, when I was 18, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a rock star drummer. And then I got into it and I discovered I don't actually like this lifestyle of, you know, every night, like you wrap up the gig at midnight and, you know, you end up at Denny's every night because it's the only thing left open and nobody actually goes to Denny's. You just end up there, right? So it's, sorry if you work at Denny's, it's just kind of, thanks for being open 24 seven. But I didn't like that. But I realized what actually I'm driven to do is inspire people. And I found out for me, The music thing isn't the best use of what I've got to inspire people. Speaking and writing is. So I leaned into the speaking and writing, but it's the same motivation. So you got to look at like, what's the thing that you're driven towards? And listen, you don't get to decide what's interesting to you. I have tried to get interested in other things that other people are interested in. Golf. I have tried to get interested in golf, Pastor Marcus. I can't do it. It's only for for the chosen, right? Yes. So I just can't get interested. But here's the thing. And then I've tried to get people interested in stuff I'm interested in. They're like, I don't get it, bro. You, do, you don't get to decide what's interesting to you, but what, when you're interested in something and it draws your attention, like Pastor Marcus talked about last week so well, um, it's going to draw you and you need to figure out what is it about it that's drawing me because there's something being spoken to you in there. Because listen, you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which the Father prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. He placed something in you and the things that interest you speak to what he's placed in you. There's something holy behind every motivation of things that, are, that draw your attention and catch your attention. So you need to pursue that and then get in your lane and stay there. That makes sense? All right, last one. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against sound judgment. Y'all may not believe this, but I am a very introverted person. Introverts, they get energy from being alone or in small groups. Extroverts get energy from being around big groups. Sundays after church, I'm exhausted. Uh, Y'all wear me out, right? It's not that you even wear me out. It's just that I get tired after having exerted this much energy. And if it were up to me, I would basically just stay at my house, except when I leave my house to go on trips by myself. I am a solo person. Sometimes my wife, she'll call me after she's been visiting her family with my daughter or something. She's like, hey, how are you? I'm like, and she's like, have you left the house? Like, no, I haven't. She's like, sweetheart, you need to get around some people because you are getting very negative. And and I'll tell you what happens when I'm isolated from people. I get these brilliant ideas in my mind about how life works. You ever hear about these people that move to Montana and live by themselves for years and write up a manifesto, right? That's what happens when you're isolated from people. You get these grand things about how life should work. But then you get back to the real world and you realize, oh, it doesn't actually work that way. Oh, communism doesn't actually work. Well, it would if I was in charge. No, buddy, it doesn't work. Face the reality. And I know in your lofty ideal, it works, but it doesn't work. And when you're not in touch with people, listen, you and Jesus may have it all worked out. Me and Jesus, we're good. It's how you live with people that prove you've got it worked out. And it's, man, life would be so easy if it weren't for people, but people are what's most important. And you cannot isolate yourself from people because when you do, it will not go well. Which leads to this next one. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. This is why I do not get involved in online debates. I don't know what fool's on the other side of that keyboard. 
but they love to express their opinion. So you don't get involved with that. So here's my point with all this. God has a path that he wants you to get on and you've got a gifting and a calling that he's given you. You've got something you're called to do. And I wanna encourage you, figure out what that is. And if you don't see it yourself, ask the people around you because they see it. They see what that gift is that's in you. They know what you're gifted at. And you can't be gifted at everything. So ask the people around you, what am I gifted at? And then when you find that, you stay in your lane and you use that to build up your family and you use that to take care of your family. But you don't just use that gift to build you up. You use that gift to build others up as well because your gift isn't just for you, it's for others. And as you use that gift, man, and you stay focused on caring for your family, don't isolate yourself. Stay engaged in community. And and, and the beautiful thing about this is, man, this is how you rise to the potential of all that God has placed in you. Because again, he's created you for great things. He has created you to accomplish his purposes. And you have a part in that. You're not here by accident. You have a purpose and he's given you something to do. So figure out what it is. And then with wisdom, walk that out. And it's going to take some making some hard decisions. You may have to say no to some good things in order to say yes to the best things, which is what a lot of these Proverbs say. Again, you're choosing what you're going to do. And you may look at some things and go, wow, that's an amazing opportunity. And then you realize excess sugar. (laughs) If I do that, it's going to be sweet for a while, but eventually it's not going to go well for my family. And you make wise choices. And in the end, you make the sacrifices and you trust that God is going to honor those things. Because when you honor his principles, you, you feel honored, but it really, it's just living in line with his principles you rise and you come, you become all that God has for you and all he intends for you to be. You guys receive that? All right, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you didn't ask us to figure this life out alone. You left us with the word of God, which is full of principles and truths that we can walk in and we can live victoriously and we can win in this life. Even when it looks like we're not winning sometimes, we know that when we're walking in accordance to what you called us to do, we're winning. So we thank you for that. If you're here this morning, you've not made the most important decision of your life, which is the decision is to follow Jesus. I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and mean it with all your heart, God is gonna come forgive your sin, transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness and set you up with him in eternity. It starts when we say this prayer. uh, Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you there back under the do it again sign. Uh, man, I pray that you guys will live with wisdom this week. If you've got a hard decision to make, some challenging things with your family, with your kids, your relationships, ask God for wisdom. He wants to give it to you. You guys be blessed. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.